Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Joey Lovestrand. I'm a British Academy postdoctoral fellow at SOAS University of London, hosting this webinar on behalf of the linguistics department. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Limor Raviv, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the Artificial Intelligence Lab at Free University of Brussels. Limor will also soon start a Minerva research group called Language Evolution and Adaptation in Diverse Situations within the Max Planck groups. And we'll be speaking to us today about the links between language evolution, language acquisition, and language diversity. So I'm going to hand it over to Limor to give us a presentation, which may last 30 or 40 minutes. Then we'll use the rest of our hour together for questions and responses. And so at that time, you can feel free to put your questions in the chat or uh, raise your hand or otherwise signal you want to ask a question uh, directly. So thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you, Limor, for preparing this presentation and uh, look forward to hearing what you have to share. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and hopefully, um, yeah, can you see my screen? Great. Yes. Okay. Um, so today in this talk, I'm going to give you a taste of my research in the past six years, which attempted to link these uh, three topics, language change or evolution, um, language acquisition and language diversity. Um, and I, it's, it's a bit of an, an overview. There's a lot of projects I'm not going to mention, uh, but I, maybe you can ask about them later if you want to, or if you already uh, um, have any uh, clarification questions in the chat and you think it's really important for me to answer them now before I move on. You can also unmute yourself and maybe just draw my attention because I can't see the chat while I'm giving the presentation. Okay. So I um, always start my talks with the same slide. I've been using this slide for the past few years, and it's this one. It's because to me, one of the most interesting questions in the field of linguistics are why are there so many different languages in the world? And of course, in this slide, you only see kind of like the major big known languages in the world. Um, but actually, there's about 7,000 different languages. Some of them are very small. Uh, some of them are in the risk of, uh, of extinction. And I wonder what are the possible sources for this astonishing linguistic diversity? Um, and I'm also curious in how different languages evolve. So what are the cognitive and communicative pressures that shape the evolution of language in our species and also in others? Um, and finally, why do languages differ so much from each other and how do they differ from each other? And um, are some languages easier to learn than others? What kind of mechanisms enable language learning across childhood and across modalities and so on? So these are a lot of big questions. Um, and in my research so far, I've been trying to shed light on these uh, questions using kind of you know, small pieces to the puzzle and using experimental methods and more recently computational methods. And I'm going to show some of this work to me. Okay, so I think the first thing to consider when talking about languages um, is that languages are constantly changing. So really, if there is one single universal pattern that we know to be 100% true for all languages in the world, and really there's only one of these universal patterns, is that if people use these languages to communicate with each other, these languages will change over time. And we can think of language evolution and language change as the process in which linguistic innovations or, or variants emerge and then spread. And in the case of the cultural evolution of language, the story is quite simple. It's this. Well, people, they, they innovate all the time. They randomly or intentionally produce new sound variants. They create new lexical words. We use new grammatical constructions. But only some of these variants are then adopted by others and spread to the entire community. So this process is generally termed cultural evolution. It's somewhat analogous to biological evolution in the sense that you have mutations and they spread as a factor of natural selection. So some variants might be better than others, but also a lot of random changes and random drift. But I'm interested in how this process actually occurs in languages. So how do language innovations emerge and spread and how fast can they become the new linguistic norm? So to do this, uh, to answer this question, I'm currently using agent-based computational modeling. In these models, you take different populations of simulated computer agents, which have carefully controlled capacities and each of them use different variants. In this illustration here, every circle is a person, their color is what variant they use, and you can see the connections indicating who speaks to whom. 
And then you can examine how different variants tend to spread in a population over time until most agents are using the same variant and you can say that a norm has been established. But more importantly, we can use these models to examine how this process is affected by the cognitive capacities and the communication patterns of these agents. And this is done by manipulating things like how flexible or stubborn these agents are. So how likely are agents to adopt to other people's variants or how likely they are to stick to their own unique uh, 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 dialects and, and forms? Or do agents have a preference for some variants over others? Um, how many variants uh, can they store in their memory? And who do they tend to copy from? So do they tend to copy from the person that is most prestigious or most connected in their community or rather their most closer uh, kins or friends? And these types of computer models can provide really valuable insights because they break down a very complex process of language change into hopefully small transparent um, steps. So just to give you a little taste of that, um, and some simulations that I've done, uh, we looked at agents' personalities. So what I said before, how likely they are to adapt or to accommodate to others. And we checked whether the proportion of flexible and stubborn agents um, affect convergence. And the results of this different simulations might not surprise you, they might be a bit trivial, but it shows that it doesn't really have a big impact on language change. So even if there is a lot of stubborn agents and people are very conformist and they don't really like to change, this only slows down the spread of variants to the entire community. So it slows down language change, but it doesn't stop it. Um, so as long as agents are not 100% stubborn and they do accommodate a little bit sometimes, the network will eventually converge on new variants. And this is important because I think it shows or why indeed it is the case that all languages change all the time, even if we don't want them to, they just do. Um, and I'm going to get back to some more computational, uh, computational modeling work later on, um, but now I'd like to shift the focus to some more experimental work I've done um, because I think it's a, uh, it, we need to take a step back before we talk about this kind of language change. So indeed, the first important question to ask is how do people even learn? the variants of their language. And looking at language acquisition, one of the biggest questions in the study of human language is how do children really discover the structure of their language? And more generally, how do they learn repeating patterns and regularities in any form uh, in their environment? And one possible answer is that children have what is called statistical learning abilities. So this is the ability to implicitly detect patterns in sensory input based on distributional properties, statistical properties, things like co-occurrences and transitional probabilities. And in the first behavioral study I ever conducted, I did this um, at the very beginning of my master's, um, I looked at this crucial mechanism and I asked two questions. The first, questions was, the first question was whether statistical learning abilities are stable across development or do they change with age? So is it the case that you learn better or worse as you grow up? The second question was whether these learning uh, abilities are stable across sensory modalities. So are learning outcomes the same? Um, or does it develop differently in the visual domain or the auditory domain? So to address these questions, I conducted this large scale study of statistical learning across modalities and across development. Um, I tested 230 children between the ages of five to 12 on matching visual and auditory tasks. And we looked at how well they learned the patterns in their input. So in this plot that you see here, you have on the x-axis the age of the child and on the y-axis how well they learned and the color coding is for whether it was visual or an auditory task. And when we compare the children's accuracy on both tasks, we found a difference in the developmental trajectory of statistical learning across modalities. So although learning improved with age in the visual modality, it was age invariant in the auditory modality. This means that auditory learning just did not change much over childhood, while people got better at learning, children got better at learning visual patterns as they grew old. And these results show that statistical learning develops differently across domains and suggest that this is not a unitary and stable capacity, but rather modality sense. Okay, so next I want to study language evolution in the lab. And specifically, I wanted to look at the emergence of linguistic structure and the process of cultural transmission in a lab setting. And I did this using iterated learning experiments where participants learn a target behavior, like an artificial language, um, and then their learning output is given as input to the next person. So what this means is that you come to the lab, you learn an artificial language, a made up mini language for something, you get tested on this language. 
And then whatever responses you put in the text uh, in the in the test box are then given as the input language to the next person. And it's basically a bit like a broken telephone game where you see how the changes occur over time, over a generation or chains of participants. And previous work by Simon Kirby and other colleagues at Edinburgh showed that this process can really lead to the creation of grammar, basically systematic compositional linguistic structure over time. And this effectively shifts the explanatory burden or the origin of grammar from having some biologically evolved capacity to just having a cultural process that shapes linguistic patterns according to our cognitive needs and biases. But when I looked at these studies, I was a bit concerned because I kept thinking, hey, what about children, right? Because one important criticism of these types of studies is that everybody who do these studies, all the participants in these iterated learning tasks are adults who already speak a language like us. So the problem with this is that older participants may benefit from better working memory, more sophisticated problem solving strategies. We might rely on our previous very extensive and explicit linguistic experience. And if this is true, then maybe the findings from previous iterated learning studies are not necessarily evidence from some underlying process that's responsible for the evolution of language, but rather just the result of already knowing a language and then bringing all your biases to these tasks. So I thought it is really crucial to test this paradigm with children as well, because children are indeed the main language learners in the real world. And they also have much less explicit knowledge of the grammar of their language, so they're much less, less likely to do this kind of grammar introducing uh, on purpose. So what I did is I created this kind of child friendly uh, iterated learning experiment and I compared the performance of 140 children to that of 100 adults on two different conditions, uh, like in the original study. We basically tried to replicate this, but with children except uh, adults. And what we found, and here what I'm, I'm plotting on the x-axis is time, so basically generation number, how many people have passed through this chain. And on the y-axis, it's the structure score, so how systematic, how grammatical uh, the languages ended up becoming. Uh, and when we compare the performance of children and adults in terms of their transmission error and their creation of structure, what I found is that, well, adults consistently create compositional languages. They significantly outperform children. They're just much better at these kind of artificial language learning tasks. Um, and children's languages didn't show a significant increase in compositionality. You can see this because there's a black line and that black line is chance. So basically everything below this black line didn't reach a threshold of what we would call a grammar and everything above it would. And you can see that the adults go over it, but the children don't. However, I wanna also draw your attention to the fact that in children's languages did become easy to learn in the same way as adults. And some children did develop languages with significant systematic structure. They did this on multiple occasions. You can see some blue lines kind of popping up, uh, but it didn't survive the transmission process. This means that the next kid it didn't pick it up. Um, and I think even more importantly um, is that we, we use additional analysis to show that the difference between children and adults in this paradigm was related to how well they learned their input language. So linking these findings back to language acquisition, what we found is that participants, it didn't matter if they were children or adults, who learned the input languages better, were also more likely to introduce more structure to their output. And this kind of strengthens the idea that you have to first learn your language and have some biases of your language in order to introduce or regularize uh, any structure. Okay. But next, I wanted to study this process of language evolution in a more realistic setting, because in the real world, clearly people don't just learn and transmit languages from generation to generations in isolation, right? We actually interact with other people. We are subjective to communicative pressure when interacting. So I wanted to test how languages can evolve in a community from scratch via communication. So how does grammatical structure emerge because of interaction? So to do this, I developed this group communication paradigm for testing the emergence of structure and the spread in a miniature community. So what I did was I brought participants to the lab and I asked them over the course of several hours to create a new artificial language to communicate with each other. Um, participants in the same group are paired with a different person every time they play a bit and then they move and talk to another person in their group. Um, and they need to interact about different types of novel scenes I'll show you how these look in a second. Basically, they're just different shapes that are moving on the screen in different directions. And they earn points when they successfully understand each other. Uh, most importantly, these participants are not allowed to use Dutch, which is their native language, or English, or any other language they know, 
they can't point, they can't gesture, nothing. They need to come up with kind of nonsense gibberish words in order to describe these scenes. And I wanna show you how a typical interaction looks like just so you kind of get an idea of how the game is working. So in a single interaction, one participant who is the producer sees a shape moving on the screen in a given direction and they need to provide a label for it. So let's say if the participant decided to call this item WAPE, um, if this word is legal, that is it's not in Dutch or English, we pass it to their partner, the guesser. So the guesser sees this word WAPE together with a grid of eight different items and they need to select what they think their partner meant. And I just wanna reassure you that although this looks very epileptic and uh, pretty, uh, like a lot going on, our participants get used to this very quickly. So over a few minutes already, they can tell apart um, the shapes and, uh, and they just do this again and again, that it becomes uh, very normal. Okay, and once the participant clicks which shape they think what it means, both of the participants get feedback. So they can see which was the right item and what their partner selected and they can learn from it for the next interaction. And then these two participants, they switch roles. So they alternate between guessing and producing, guessing and producing, guessing and producing multiple times. And after they do this for about 20 minutes, they leave and they go interact with somebody else in their group. Okay. And importantly, at the beginning of this experiment, the participants are really, really guessing. What, they have no idea what's going on. They're making up random names. They're just clicking on things. But over the course of several hours, they slowly start developing linguistic structure and regularities, which are anchored in some uh, uh, successful interactions. So essentially they start creating a grammar. And in this grammar, there is a different part word for describing the shapes and different part words for describing their motion. And we see this again and again and again in this group communication paradigm, different groups create different grammars, but essentially they all kind of converge on this idea of having some systematicity in their lexicon. And through this experiment, we can examine these emerging languages on several measures. We can look at whether participants successfully understand each other, um, whether the group ends up uh, converging on a shared language, or is it just the case that everybody just stick to their own uh, language? We can look at how much do these languages change over time and how systematic and compositional these grammars are. And this paradigm really allows us to look at how languages evolve in a community in real time. And to see that like very, these kind of basic um, simple communication pressures can really, um, between people can really lead to the creation of systematic grammars um, over time, which again, I think is really cool. Also then they spread to the entire community. Okay. So this work on language evolution led me to ask questions about language diversity. So why do we have so many different languages in the world with so many different levels of grammatical complexity? So one thing that may cause languages to be different is the fact that they're spoken in different social environments. So languages evolve in different communities with different population sizes, different social structure and different social needs. And the idea is that languages may adapt to fit these different social needs. So using the group communication paradigm I just showed you, I was able to experimentally tease apart different social features that may affect language diversity, namely community size and network structure, and to test how they shape the evolution of languages in the lab. So focusing now on the effect of community size, here I asked, how does changing the size of the group, the size of the community, affect the languages that would evolve in it? So does interacting with more people lead to diff a difference in the language's structure? So to this end, I compared languages that were formed in small groups of four people to those formed in larger groups of eight people. And I wanna reassure you that even though it's clear that both of these group size, sizes are really small compared to the real world. In the real world, even a group of eight people is very, 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 very small for a language community. But the point is that in this miniature setting, in an artificial language setting where you have only a few meanings to communicate with and only a few hours to do so, just doubling the number of people in the group already makes a significant difference to the languages. So it's a miniature setup and also a miniature manipulation, but doubling the number of people has an impact on these languages. So I'm gonna show you what we found. Again, on the x-axis I'm plotting time. So this is the time since the beginning of the experiment. And on the y-axis I'm plotting how systematic this, the language is. I'm not gonna get into how we measured this now because it's a bit complicated, but if you're interested in knowing, yeah, how do you measure grammar in these languages, then please ask me at the end of the talk. I'm happy to explain. Um, and what we found here is that 
The languages of big groups were more systematic and the big groups created this more systematic grammar faster and more consistently. Um, so I don't know if you can see the little lines behind the very thick line. So every line represents a group. And what you can see is that the small groups, the blue lines, some of them are really high on the structure, but some of them are really low. So they're kind of all over the place. But if you look at the big groups, the, um, the red lines, they're all kind of very systematically and consistently developing higher levels of structure together. Um, and the explanation for this trend was that the need to develop systematic languages is much higher in a larger. So the idea is that people in larger communities have less shared history with each other and they're exposed to more input variability, just more variability in general. Um, so maybe in a small group, you could just remember each other's unique variations. I can remember that you say booba and you say kiki and that's fine and I can just remember it. But uh, this is really hard to do in a big community. You have much more people to interact with. There's a lot of variability and therefore there is somehow a pressure to favor something that is simpler, more systematic, more grammatical. Um, uh, that can help you ease convergence. So although convergence is harder in a big group, just because it's harder to agree with eight people than with four, it's also much more need. Um, okay, and this means that, as I said, members of the big communities are seemingly under this pressure to create languages that are more generalizable somehow, uh, that can help them to communicate. And these experimental findings showed that community size can really affect patterns of language diversity such that the social and communicative pressures that are associated with language use can shape the, really the nature of languages created in different communities. Okay, but this also has conclusions, uh, really important conclusions for language learning, language acquisition, because think about it. If languages with more regular and compositional grammars are easier to learn, as is assumed by many, many, many people, and if such languages tend to develop more in big communities, and this suggests that some languages are acquired faster than others, and that this learning advantage can then be traced back to community size and to the degree of systematicity in the language. And I have to say, this goes against a really widespread axiom in the field of linguistics, at least back in the day, that stated that all, all languages are equally hard to learn and take the same effort to acquire. There's a lot of kind of recent evidence, even from child language acquisition, that shows that this is probably not the case. Some languages, for example, Danish, seem to be much harder for children to learn. But even when you compare children, for example, at the age of five, their linguistic knowledge and their grammatical knowledge is um, kind of what we would call delayed compared to other languages like English, which is uh, considered really simple. Um, and this is, this is something to keep in mind. And I have to say, when we use terms like simple, complex, regular, um, I, I see here my co-author Cedric in the audience, and I'm just gonna mention this, there is no, uh, there's nothing fundamentally better or worse about being simpler or being more complex. These are associated with different things, for example, um, a simple kind of clear, transparent, predictable language can be really, really good for learning, really, really good with commu for communication. Uh, and a complex language, some people might think, oh, it's more sophisticated, it's, it's more elaborate. But those are just judgments that we kind of put on um, these terms. They mean nothing except for um, a description of how systematically and transparent these grammars are. Um, we're actually writing a piece about this point right now. Um, but again, so this is just about how easy it is to learn and to use. Um, okay, and so to test this idea that more structured languages are easier to learn, um, we conducted another, another study. Basically what I did is to take the languages, the final languages that were created by the big and small groups in this previous experiment I just showed you. These languages varied in how structured they were. Um, and then I just taught them to a hundred new people that were not a part of the original community. So these people were exposed to the language and they had all these trials and training blocks where they had to guess the words and produce the words and they were trained on these words for about an hour. And then we gave them a test to see how well they learned. And the results were very clear. They showed that languages with more systematic grammars, again, here it's plotted on the X axis, how systematic the language is. On the Y axis, how well people learned it and reproduced it. So languages with more systematic structure were learned better. Participants were more accurate at reproducing these languages. They learned them faster and they learned them more consistently. Again, I just wanna point out, um, if you can see, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, um, I'm gonna hope uh, you can. So on the very left uh, edge, 
of the of the plot are languages with very low structure. So languages that are not structured at all. They basically don't have a grammar. Every word represents something else, and you just have to memorize all of them. As you can see, some people were really good at learning that. That wasn't a problem. They were able to learn it, but some people were really bad. Okay, so the individual differences were really big for the small languages, for the um, unstructured languages. But when you look at the highly systematic languages, everybody is clustered at the top. Everybody can learn it. Everybody reaches ceiling. So it doesn't really matter if you have good memory, if you're very motivated, you can learn it easily in one hour. Um, so this is really important because it confirms this relationship between learnability and systematicity. And even more interestingly, I wanted to know how can people generalize the language they learned to new unfamiliar meanings that they've never seen before. So can learners actually apply the languages they learned to new contexts, right? That's what makes our languages so productive and useful. Um, and also will different people, will different learners do this in the same way? So to this end, I gave participants another test at the end. They saw 12 scenes with new combinations of shape and direction that um, they, they haven't been trained on before. And they were asked to label them according to what they thought would be correct based on the language they learned. Um, so participants in this uh, part could do whatever they want. They can make up totally new words so they don't generalize at all. Um, they could use homonyms, so replicate words and reuse words they've already learned. Um, they could combine words. They can use the rules of the language if there were any. They really could do whatever they wanted here. And more importantly, I looked at the generalizations of different participants that learned the same language and asked how similar they are. So do different people generalize new scenes in the same way and use the same words, despite never learning these words, never interacting with each other? So when we looked at the similarities between these generalizations, again, very clear results. Participants who learned more structured languages we're much more likely to produce the exact same words, the same generalizations. And this finding suggests that systematicity can allow strangers to converge effortlessly. So people who never interacted before could potentially communicate successfully about new things and immediately be understood. And if you remember, this is exactly the mechanism that we postulated for the group communication paradigm that I just showed you. So it's about having more structured languages that can facilitate convergence in a big group with more people. And this finding here directly supports this idea. It shows that the benefits of linguistic structure or grammar go beyond learnability. It's not just that it's easier to learn. It's also that it's advantageous for communication between the individuals and it aids productivity and general languages. Okay, so the next thing I did was look at network structure. So does it have the same effect as community size? And here I ask what happens when groups are of the same size, um, but they vary in how much and how community members, um, uh, community members are connected to each other. Um, so this is, uh, you know, in the process of, of language evolution, can we also say that it's shaped by the density or the sparsity of the group? And in the previous experiment, all the groups were fully connected. So everybody in the group spoke to everybody else in the group. But in the real world, this is rarely the case, right? Larger communities are typically more sparse, less connected. Many people never meet. You will some people in your community you will never interact with. And also not everybody is equally connected. So some people interact with many other people uh, and other people are more isolated. So looking at the role of network structure and density independently from community size, I went and compared three different types of networks, three different types of groups. The first group was this fully connected group in red. This is exactly like before. So everybody talks to everyone. And uh, although this resembles early human societies, it may be quite rare nowadays. So maybe we can see this in some hunter-gatherer communities, or some villages, but it's overall pretty a pretty rare network structure to have. The second network we looked at was a small world network. This is here in blue. These networks are much sparser. They have much less connections. In fact, exactly half. So we, we uh, uh, delete half the number of potential connections between people. But they're more realistic in the sense that um, strangers here are indirectly connected. So for example, participant G and H, they never interact directly. You see that there's no line between them, but they are connected indirectly via participant F, for example, or participant D. So innovations can still flow in this community. And the last network we looked at was a scale-free network in green. So these networks have been argued to be the most representative of modern human societies. 
they're also sparser. They're exactly like the blue networks in the sense of having the same number of connections, but they follow what is called a power law where few agents are highly connected. In this case, if you look at participant A, he is what we call the hub. He is connected to almost everybody else in the group. Um, but most agents are less connected. For example, participant E or D, which are quite isolated. Okay, and um, here our prediction was that the sparser networks, the blue and the green, would create more systematic languages for the same reasons as before. Because sparser networks are typically more variable and people have less shared history and it's hard to remember the variants of all these people that you may not interact with directly, um, convergence should be harder in these networks um, and therefore much more needed. So they might be under a stronger pressure to create systematic languages. Um, but spoiler alert, this is not what we found. So when we looked at the results uh, of this experiment, we found no significant differences between these three network conditions. So all the networks showed the same degree of high structure throughout the experiment and also showed similar behavioral patterns when looking at all the other measures I mentioned before, like stability and accuracy and so on. So you can really see these lines are all kind of going together in the same way. And in retrospect, this result um, makes sense because we found that there was no differences in the input variability across these conditions. So it was not the case that the sparser networks were more diversified. Um, but I do want to um, urge you that although this doesn't seem to have an effect in, in this experiment, so when size is kept constant and relatively small, it's important not to draw any strong conclusions from this null result. That's eventually what this is. There's many reasons why we can imagine that network structure didn't have an effect in this current design. Uh, maybe our network didn't differ sufficiently from each other, or maybe they were not big enough, maybe in a network of 20 people that would have worked. Um, or because of other methodological limitations. And in the discussion of this paper here, we actually list a few things that we really think could be improved um, in future research. So we really need to take another step in order to understand uh, what is the true role of network structure. Okay, so this is kind of, until now was kind of an overview of what I've done so far. Um, but I also wanna uh, give you a taste, a glimpse into some of my future projects because soon as, um, uh, as you heard from Joey, I'm going to start my own research group at the Max Planck Institute, um, a group called LEADS in short, and I have three major projects and I want to share them with you. So the first project is about linking experimental results to data from computational modeling. So the idea is to take the patterns that were obtained from real groups of human participants during the communication, the group communication study I just showed you, and to compare them to patterns obtained from different sized populations of these interacting simulated agents. But in this case, the simulations, the simulated agents are not kind of too simple in order to really match human behavior. Um, so we're going to use uh, deep learning. And this is uh, a collaboration with other brilliant scientists. The idea is we're in very, very early stages of this project. Um, the idea is to develop a very close model of participants' behavior um, using groups of uh, networks of interacting AIs. So neural networks that will interact with each other and do the same thing that our participants are doing. So this is the architecture of the network. It doesn't really matter. The idea is that it will have different levels. The first level will teach these networks how to see the world. So like our participants, they first need to learn how to differentiate between these different shapes moving in different directions and to identify what are the relevant features for categorization. The next thing is to match these scenes, just like the participants are doing. Then there will be, they will learn slowly how to speak and listen to how to associate a string of text to, um, uh, to these uh, uh, um, scenes that they've just learned how to, to see and categorize. Um, and uh, well, and I think that's, that's really important to learn how to speak and listen. And this kind of brings us back to questions about language acquisition, because how will these different neural networks learn to speak and listen? Uh, how fast can they pick up on the structure and regularities of their environment? This is very likely to be through the same processes that we've I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, like statistical learning or uh, Bayesian inference, which is what our computer models are doing. Um, so tracking the core occurrences and updating the possibility of a given mapping as a result of experience. Um, and once we have that established, we can return to examine the evolution of grammatical structure. And to this end, we plan to teach these networks how to successfully communicate with each other. Um, so basically having different networks interact such that one network would produce a text for a target scene 
the other network would take this text and need to match it to the right scene from a set of possible scenes. Really exactly the same type of interaction that we had in the experiment I just showed you with human participants. So the question is when these networks interact with each other over time, will their representations and associated texts also change as a function of interaction? And will we see the same patterns of emerging structure and emerging grammar in a population of AI? And of course, we can also ask questions about language diversity. So manipulating the size of this AI population and see if we can replicate the experimental findings that larger populations develop more structured languages. Okay, so this is kind of, this is one project. The second project, um, uh, the second thing we can do with kind of linking computational modeling to this group communication paradigm is to investigate new and exciting topics about community structure. And here in the second project, we're going to look at age and gender diversity and how they shape the process of language formation and innovation. Um, so one of the most intriguing findings in social linguistics is that the gender and age of speakers can really affect the process of language change. Specifically, it was suggested that women are actually the leaders of language change. There are some studies that show that women are often more linguistically innovative than men. They tend to adopt new variants more frequently. And similarly, there are studies that show that teenagers around the age of 17 also tend to create and adopt new variants much more often than adults. And although I think we have all have an intuition as to teenagers changing languages and having their all kind of new slang, um, why women would be uh, leaders of language change is a bit less known. Um, and more importantly, all these claims are based on several case studies. So all we can do in these kind of documented language changes to see a language change happening in process and then try to trace it back um, to where it started. But once we start investigating it, it's already very much in the, uh, in the process of change if we've noticed it. Um, so it was never tested experimentally or computa computationally from the very, very, very early stages. Um, uh, of uh, uh, emergence in real time, so not right flow actively. Um, so we currently don't know how population differences in gender and age really influence cultural evolution, uh, language innovation and language change, and whether different linguistic tendency is really gonna be associated with male versus female speakers and adult versus teen speakers. So in this future project, we will couple the experimental methods and computational modeling to determine whether women and adolescents really lead the process of language change. Um, specifically, we will use this group communication paradigm and simulated populations to manipulate the composition of these mini societies in terms of the de gender and age of individuals. So for example, testing different groups of participants that are either homogeneously men, here, paint, you know, here in blue, men biased, gender balance, so half, half, um, women biased or homogeneously women. So, um, or and the same for uh, age. So whether groups of all teenagers, all adults, age balanced and so on. So will such changes in the identity of group members influence the creation and spread of linguistic norms over time? And is it really the case that women uh, and teenagers lead this process uh, and adopt and create novel words faster? Okay, and last but not least, and these are my few final slides, um, the third project is about looking at language um, evolution and uh, adaptation um, to a virtual reality environment. So here what we're going to do is virtual reality environment offers high ecological validity and a more naturalistic setup that allows you to have still high experimental control. Um, so we already have the stimuli for this experiment. It's uh, going to be different kind of funny novel creatures um, that are uh, different in their shape, their size, their movement types, or whether they hop or bounce, and their movement speed. And the goal of this adaptation is to test how modality differences affect the process of language evolution. So specifically, we're going to look at the process of language formation when using gestures, when using vocalizations, or when using both. And looking at how gestural and vocal languages are formed in the VR environment, we can really see the multimodal origin of languages. A lot of people wonder, how did the first languages look like? Were they signed? Were they vocal? Um, when did we shift? A lot of people think that we started by gesturing and then shift to a vocal languages, but why? So what are the comparative advantages and disadvantages of each of these modalities during the emergence of a novel communication system? So here we predict, for example, that grammatical structure and iconicity will emerge in both modalities. You can imagine size, the size of the creature, being expressed iconically in the signed modality by using a bigger gesture, but it can also be expressed iconically in speech by using a high or a low vowel for big and uh, for small and big items, um, uh, respectively. But um, it's very likely that there would be more systematicity or, or more iconicity, sorry, in the gestural modality because it's easier um, to have uh, iconicity and gestured modality. 
And more importantly, we can use this VR paradigm to look at questions related to language diversity and specifically asking if languages also adapt to their physical environment. Um, what happens if we add noise in these uh, uh, experiments would adaptations occur? So in particular, we plan to introduce wind to the VR environment by playing a sound on the speakers that masks the S sound. And our prediction is that in such a windy environment, the vocal languages would include less S sounds or even not at all, because these would be much harder to detect. So really showing that the conditions the environmental conditions can change the phonology or the basic building blocks of language. Uh, and, then the, uh, and then the gestural condition, we will introduce poor lighting. So basically darken the room. Uh, and in this case, we predict that the sign languages will also have to adapt by making the gestures larger and more salient, uh, maybe accompanying them with uh, vocalizations. And this can also uh, influence the interplay between iconicity and systematicity, because if larger gestures can no longer be used to indicate larger creatures, this might force participants to shift away from iconicity into more arbitrary gestures. Okay. So that's it for me. I just want to conclude by saying that um, my research tried to tie um, these things using, using uh, different methods. And I want to uncover the time course and social dynamics and cognitive mechanisms that characterize these processes. There's a lot of other projects I didn't talk about. For example, um, looking at complex cultures of elephants, <laughs> the role of children in language change. I have some swarm robotics models that we use, a lot of stuff but they all share the same goal. And that is to promote this kind of multifaceted understanding of a very complex phenomenon. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm very, very happy to take them now. And I just wanna thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Limon. It's a really fascinating presentation. I'm just gonna switch my view here. Um, so do feel free to uh, put your questions in the chat or raise your hand if you'd like a question. We did get one question already from Abu. Um, Abu asked if you have any comments on bilingual, multilingual people. So I guess that's one more, you know, complex factor is what happens at language context. Uh, it's understandable why you've started this in more of a monolingual context, but what, what do you think, what would you think in terms of how that plays into this whole story? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in a way, none of our participants are really monolingual in the very pure sense of the word. They are at least, um, so some of my participants were recruited in Israel. Um, uh, like the, the first experiments I showed, then the, they speak Hebrew and often English. Uh, in, the, in the recent uh, work, it's Dutch speakers who often also speak English. So in a way, everybody is a bilingual and everybody's a bilingual when they come to learn the artificial languages, right? They all already know a language and now they're learning this in a new context. Um, and this definitely might have an effect because I think prior knowledge is a really big determined, really big factor and how well and how easy it is to learn a new language. So we find that, you know, it's easy on some levels, it's easier to learn a language that's similar to our, the languages we already know in terms of structure and, uh, and grammar. On other levels, it's harder because um, it means that there's more competition. Some words are very similar and only a, a tiny difference. So maybe sometimes it's also easy to learn something that's remote. And there's a lot of research on what makes um, uh, second language learning easier or harder. And as we said, similarity is a really big factor, but also motivation. Um, I think for me, those questions are only interesting, interesting as far as they can tell us something about general language use. So the, the nitty gritty details between L1 and L2 and whether it's different because of this morpheme or that morpheme, that's very interesting for many people who work on language learning. But for me, interested in kind of the big kind of giant picture, why do our species have language and how does it look like? Um, it only matters because prior knowledge, I think is what tells apart, not only bilinguals to monolinguals, but also children and adults. Uh, also uh, people with late exposure to language and early exposure to language. And those are kind of the, that's, the, that's where the, uh, the gold uh, consequences uh, are. It's when does, it, when does it break down learning? Uh, or when does it boost something? For example, the reason I went to study children in the very first experiment with iterated learning is because I was afraid that exactly being a proficient bilingual, a person, or in that, this case, a proficient language user might really change the patterns that we see in this experiment. And I was happy to find out that with children, on some levels, even though they had less knowledge and they were generally pretty bad at this experiment, it seems like they're going through the same patterns and the same uh, and the same um, yeah the same trajectories that you would expect from a let's say a, 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 
or discolored at all. Um, and that's interesting because it means that these paradigms can tell us something valuable about language evolution and language change. Um, and if children would not be able to, sh to do anything similar to the adults, I would be in serious doubt in taking any big conclusion from these iterative uh, learning models, because I'd say, okay, if they don't work with a non-proficient language learner, then they're not very interesting. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's great. Jonathan, you had a question? Yeah, I do. Yeah, so Limor, thanks very much for a really super interesting paper. You're asking some massive questions and, and you know, trying to innovate some really interesting research designs to get at them. So, you know, I can only applaud that. Um, I was kind of, I sat there reflecting on your uh, social network experiment for a little while. Um, and I was trying to work out, you know, what, what might have gone wrong and why you had the sort of non-significant results. And then you started talking about the sociolinguistic literature, right? Um, and, you know, correct me at any stage here or, or feel free to shoot me down by all means. I'm just sort of, you know, spitballing. But, you know, when you started talking about these sort of gender effects, for instance, um, you know, they're, they're couched in a very narrowly specified theory that have not been tested, you know, certainly on outside of big dominant Western languages, right? And there's plenty of data now to suggest that elsewhere you don't find these patterns. Um, so I, I kind of wondered at that point whether this is related to the social network experiment in that it's difficult to capture, right, um, cross-social, cross-cultural intricacies in this modeling. And, and I just want, I, I just, I guess I'm just offering some reflection and wondered what you had to say about that. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's right on the money because one of the reasons we're doing these experimental work and these computational models is to really tease apart and try to isolate this one specific thing that may cause languages to be different, which in the world, in the real world, even when we find a pattern, we don't know what to attribute it to. It's correlated with gender, great. But that doesn't say anything about causality. And it doesn't say anything about why gender is driving this effect or what is it about gender? Maybe it's about, a maybe there's a mediating factor altogether. So indeed for the experiments with the um, uh, age and gender, I was just presenting them very briefly, but the goal is to, in a way, dig, dig deeper. So if we do find that, for example, adolescents in this paradigm tend to innovate more, it will be very interesting to find, is this something about their social role in society? So the fact that they're less pressured to conform, for example, or that they're, it can even be something about, you know, hormones or peer pressure or peer-to-peer -peer convergence. Those are, and then you can try, if you have a th good theory about why that would be the case, you can simulate it in these experiments with not ad uh, adolescents. So take adults, put them in different social niches where one has to be conformist or prime them with flexibility patterns or, or, um, or uh, innovative patterns, and then see whether you get them to behave like adolescents in this paradigm. So uncovering what is it about this age group that drives this effect. And the same for women, because I think the literature about women as leaders of language change was, first of all, it's rather, some of it is new, like, you know, work by, uh, by Eckhart showing, you know, the constructions like like and be like, they come from uh, teenage girls. But there's also some work in, from the 70s about other more isolated languages. And I think here, the question is, what is it about women that makes them more innovative or more accommodating? Is it about our biology? Is there something, for, pardon my, uh, my French, but something about my genitals that make us more innovative? I don't think so. I think it's really about the social niche and the social role that women played in these communities. Maybe by being, for example, more isolated and not going to work, and I'm talking about the early work from the 70s, um, it, it, living in this kind of more isolated woman-like communities rather than going to work with your briefcase and needing to be all formal and uh, conformist. That might mean that you're more likely to, in that sense, makes them a bit more teenage-like in the sense that they're lacking some of the conformist pressures. You can also imagine that this is about something else entirely, which is about the uh, um, expectation that women are more accommodating, women will adopt more, they will, they're more agreeable, they're less uh, rigid. And again, depending on what social, what social hypothesis you go by, you can try to simulate that in the lab. Some prime people with being more, uh, more accommodating or more flexible, uh, priming people with being more um, uh, isolated in their group and so on and see what happens. So it's not so much about the factors of the specific communities, but really trying to find the, the reason for why. And then it would hopefully be something that you can say, okay, this is not just a weird society pattern. Yeah. 
And in a more or less, you know, gender equal community, you would expect to find a different pattern, a different role for women. Um, but you know, I think we're very we're very far from really understanding this. I think the first step would be to try to even just replicate these findings in the lab, which I'm not sure would happen. Uh, in the lab, you really strip everybody from all their roles. Mm-hmm. Women and men come to the lab, and maybe they don't carry their all these social biases from their culture. Yeah, I share your pessimism in trying to replicate that, uh, but I'll, I'll wait for the paper to sort of complete. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question, hand up. Do you want to unmute yourself? Mm, <clears throat> look, I have, I have a comment on the, uh, on the question. Uh, actually, there are two comments. One is, uh, this is fascinating. I mean, we'll see, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm greatly impressed. And I, uh, and I've seen a few, a few things. Uh, and uh, um, the, 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 another comment is that what, what you said about um, the role of women. Uh, another role of women is uh, is uh, known from the label um, is known under the label the grandmother effect, that women are great preservers of the language, right? And it might be that it's precisely what you are saying. It would be two sides of the same coin mm. that they uh, they stay in the familiar environment that they're under under not not under so much pressure to conform to the majority out there so on the one hand they could lead their the innovation but on the other hand they have the uh, the um luxury of uh preserving the old forms or the the, the old language right uh, and of course everybody, everybody knows what i'm here referring to right so so uh, it's uh it would be uh, fascinating, I think, to find a, a, a kind of common denominator for these two so apparently different roles. Yeah. Uh, and the question is, do you have a closed set of collaborators or, or uh, are you interested in, in uh, working with phonologists from the outside, for example? Uh, Definitely. Oh, yes. I, believe, okay. I believe in teamwork. So most of my projects, as you saw, there were multiple logos on the top. It's because generally I believe Great. more brains better. <laughs> um, yeah, because we could make some assumptions about the complexity of uh, phonological systems and also about the presence or absence of marked and unmarked. I mean, unmarked are always there, but the marked features, right? And which marked features and... Okay, so definitely, so, so, feel, definitely feel free to drop me an email. And yeah, I do want to so, say um, about what you just said, this is really important because one thing I didn't mention is women's role as teachers, right? So as mothers, at least again, this depends on how gender unequal your community is. You might assume that children will get most of their language from their mother and not their father or from their female kindergarten teacher rather right. than their male kindergarten teacher. So again, this is another prediction that has to do with the role of women in the society and being a being a teacher, on one hand, you preserve norms, but also your innovations as an adult um, would then get transmitted as well. Right, so it, it's really, it's really a two, a two, a two-way street. And that's yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. We got another question in the chat from DeAndre, and I happen to know that DeAndre just accepted an offer at University of Oregon to do his PhD in linguistics there. So congratulations, DeAndre. Congratulations. Uh, his question was early in the presentation. You mentioned being able to describe the criteria for thresholds of being more grammatical in structure or not. Uh, were you able to? Would you describe what those criteria were? Yeah. So this is a pretty common measure in um, language evolution. Um, and uh, all these iterated learning uh, paradigms and we just expanded on it and adopted it. So basically it's trying to find um, correlations between the way meanings are different and the way the strings or the words are different. So if we can imagine that um, words that share similar features would also share similar part words. I mean, and this is in language is very hard to give this example because so I imagine that there is a, a green, a green red, a green little chair and a green little basket. Those things are different in one feature, which is what they are, and are similar on two adjectives. So you'll expect them to get the same transcription in language. So looking at the differences between between what people describe and how they describe it. And in a language that's unsystematic, we find very low correlations between meanings and strings. So similar meanings are, can be expressed with very different words and different words can, different meanings can be expressed with very similar words. And in a systematic grammatical language, you see this predictable relationship 
where things that are sharing features also share morphemes or share sub uh, uh, part words. Um, and we do this, we calculate the humming distances between the meanings, and we do kind of a, a correlation there. And then we ca calculate the Levenstein distances, which is a measure of how words differ from each other, the number of uh, insertions, deletions, and replacements you have to do to make one word into another. And that shows how similar the words are, and then we correlate these two. And then we see whether indeed it is the case that similar meanings are expressed using similar words or not. And that's that's the measure. And it's um, it's uh, some math, but uh, generally it captures really well whether there is this grammar, this part morphemes associated with meanings. If a language really doesn't have it, it gets scored very, very low. Thanks. I get one more question from this one from Sally Coco. Yes, uh, one in initial question and a couple of comments. Um, are there languages that are less systematic than others? Yeah, definitely. So in these, so first of all, I mean, uh, there are, there's a lot of literature on its typological cross diversity studies of, of languages uh, today um, at work. Uh, I am happy, I mean, I'm sure you may know this already, but there's some work that looked at, for example, WALS and tried to uh, correlate, you know, different features and thinking things like uh, Lupian and Dale. They've, you know, the number of morphological effects is the number of uh, irregularities the number of case markings, um, how untransparent those markings are. So the more kind of features you have that's, that's considered to be more complex, um, languages like Creoles, but also English, tend to have actually quite a, a, um, um, a very systematic, very high kind of, I often tend to refer to this as elegant, but of course it's not necessarily more elegant, but just kind of simpler and straightforward. A uh, way of, uh, of uh, grammaticalizing different features, and I think these the problem with these studies is that every study use a different metric of complexity, and when you use a different metric of complexity, you can get a different result. And um, the, I think it's all these studies tend to agree that there is differences between languages, but on what and how to measure them, then I think there's a lot of work ahead. Yeah, that has a very very deplorable bias. Uh, and the bias is that we learn languages by rules, right? It's well, groundless. You wouldn't know the rules before learning the words and discovering patterns. Well, so I and come from a, yeah. Second, I don't know that Creoles can be learned more easily than say Japanese yeah, or, yeah. Um, Iroquois or what, some other language. Nobody has conducted that kind of analysis. Exactly. These are prejudices that we shouldn't rely on. No, definitely. I, I agree with you 100%. I think those studies are missing. And in a way, trying to do this in an artificial setup is the first step, trying to take a language that we have no biases towards, no association, and just measuring the systematicity of the language, seeing if it's learned more easily. Now the question is, how do you do this with real world languages? And what are the, who, so if you take a Japanese, if you try to, con, uh, you know, to contrast Japanese, English and, and a right. Creole, it also depends who is learning these languages. Some people might find the Creole easier than the Japanese and vice versa. So it's really important to do this study in a diverse participant pool. Nobody and has done this to my knowledge. And, and the other thing, nobody waits until they have learned a critical mass of items and rules in a language before speaking. So I come from a... It's, from all, a it's all incremental. For me, for me the, the discipline that I kind of grew up in and the way I was trained in my linguistic training is not a generative approach. It's a usage-based approach relying on item-based learning and statistical learning. And maybe later on in life, children uh, can extract these kind of rule, higher rules and abstractions and representations of their language. But the way yeah. I perceive language learning is really an incremental step-by-step, -step, almost rot learning to a certain extent until at some point you discover a pattern and a former rule. But at the very therefore, beginning, yeah. Therefore, that would lead you to refrain from statements such, such as languages that are more systematic than others. Because in the beginning, you know, everybody is at the same stage trying to figure out what the patterns are. Yes, yes, definitely. And this is okay. why, so, 
No, you're, I 100% I agree with you. I think in the discussion, we make a very important point about the fact that the very beginning, this is indeed, there is no advantage. It's really later on, some people learning a systematic language would be like, you know, the, 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 they would get this realization that, hey, all these words share something in common, there is a rule. And that would make yeah. it easier to learn the next word. So learn, people right. who learn low structured languages, they never get this, this rule and therefore they right. rely more on their memory. So this is the variability in learning. Some people are really okay with this. Some people struggle right. more. And in the right. high structured languages, we just don't see this. Everybody forms a rule, easy peasy, yeah. That's, that's not, a brilliant point. We are not equal when it comes to learning. Yes, exactly. And when, so when you deal with language diversity, there's something that cognitively should be factored in. You know, if you have taught a class and you give an assignment and you see the answers, none of them is really perfect. And yet they are imperfect in different ways. That's a question that we have to address. Yeah. Uh, I, you I'm know, gonna... we, we have, we vary in the ways in which we solve problems. Yeah, for sure, indeed. And I have a feeling that all these um, effects that I find in the lab, the group size or network or diversity, it's really about variability and heterogeneity. At the very end, it's about how much we share with other people. And that leads to the prediction. I mean, this is very important, of course, for your work, but the prediction that in a very diverse, heterogeneous uh, setup where people come, for example, from completely different language backgrounds, the prediction yeah. there would be that they would develop languages that are very systematic. You can, some people think of this as simple, but this is again, not the right word to use it. It's about how predictable right. and grammatical the language is. In my, I, I, I have one project that I haven't mentioned and that is, uh, it's, a, it's haven't, hasn't been done yet, but it's gonna be done. To do this group communication pa paradigm where you take people either from different language backgrounds or you first teach them an artificial language of different types and then you have them all come together and communicate and they have to bridge these gaps and form a new language together. My prediction is that those languages would be more structured than the bigger group languages, even if it's a small community, just because there's so much diversity and thing and going on, you really need to accommodate for all these individual differences. So I, I really yeah. am very much inspired by uh, but by your, your thoughts and your comments, and I think you're you're really right on the money. And then I'd like to suggest something else with the networks. In real life, our most natural, well, not natural, our most common interactions a dyadic or triadic. And we have preferred interlocutors in the sense that we tend to interact with more or less the same people. Although our dyads and triads are going to overlap and vary. It's something that you can probably build in your model and see how far you go. Because if you leave it where it's just a matter of random interactions with different individuals. Your predictions are going to be very different. And when we speak of emergence of norms, the bottom line is what are the norms that emerge from our dyadic and triadic interactions with our preferred interlocutors. Yeah. And if you do it that way, then population size takes a different kind of uh, dimension. I don't know that a smaller population is going to produce norms earlier or faster than a larger population. Yeah. Uh, those are different dynamics, really. No, definitely. And in the real world, you, it's impossible to tease these apart because small communities are typically more dense and have these kind of tight knits. Right. Uh, and in the real world, large populations have just a different structure. So this is, I think, the benefit of these models and experiments is that only in right. the world can we yeah. look at one feature at a time? I yeah. see we're, we're getting close to running out of time, but could I just follow up with a related question on that? Because you've, you've sort of talked a bit about this usage-based background and you mentioned something about how you're showing grammar being formed through social structures and not this biological thing. I'm wondering how, how directly do you see that as sort of a polemic against the Chomskyan approach in the minimalist program? Was that just something you'd rather hint at and not sort of take on head on as 
um, sort of a, an argument against that being a necessary component of a you know a model of syntax? Um, this is yeah okay big question. I have a lot of respect for uh, Chomsky and his theories. I learned studied them all very meticulously, and I think they at least at the time were based on what we knew. And uh, they seem very plausible and they contributed a lot to our understanding of cognitive linguistics and so on. I think now at this point in time, we have not so many evidence that supports the assumptions on which Chomsky based his, um, based his for example, poverty of stimuli, um, which is you know, a crucial a kind of assumption and, and, a, um, a, and, a, and a, a principle, a factor in those theories. Today, we know that the stimuli is, is not poor. In fact, it's very rich. Children get exposed to, you know, our neural networks can learn language to a very, very reliable, surprising degree from getting exposed to child-directed speech. We know that people do correct the errors of their uh, their children, and they do this. And so there is a lot of kind of just developmental data, also showing that children are not very great at learning their language, and sometimes until the age of seven or eight, still, you know, make a lot of mistakes that we wouldn't expect them to have if they had, I don't know, an innate capacities or a principle and parameters, um, a component. So I think this is what good science is about. It's about coming up with an engaging theory that pushes the field forward, creates, you know, a pressure to make more experimental observations and test this theory. And then some parts of the theory get refuted and replaced and other parts maybe get preserved. But that is what science is about. So I'm not, I don't think it's about being against, it's about making it, you know, developing the theory more and more based on data. And I'm uh, very happy to be convinced that I'm wrong if I get presented with data from child uh, learning showing um, uh, an innate uh, bias. I'm very happy to change my views. And it's really about kind of being data anchored. Um, and I think sadly, there is not so much support for currently for the Chomskyan approach when you look at child learning uh, patterns. Well, I want to be a bit respectful of everyone's time. So I know there's some more questions, there's more questions in the chat too. But I think what I'll do here is say thank you and stop the recording. But if people want to keep chatting, uh, we'll either pass on the Moore's email address or if people are able to stay in chat, that's fine too. So let's say thank you to Lee Moore for this presentation and for engaging with everyone's questions. Lots of interesting topics, of course, are coming up and we could definitely continue to discuss this uh, very long. But thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.